Hey guys, here we are in our fifth section of our Bible study, understanding the grand narrative of Scripture. We began with creation, and then the central conflict, and then the third one was called covenant, the fourth called call, and now the fifth called captivity. Uh, it's about Exodus and Sinai and the, in the uh, Mosaic uh, covenant. So you can see that uh, in my poetic way of trying to start each of these lessons with the letter C, if you learn the C words, you'll kind of get the story of Scripture. And uh, I want to begin by just pointing out that in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, it says that a new king who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. And so it's really Israel's story. Uh, that begins at this point in the slave brickyards of Egypt. And th this new king comes to the conclusion that there are too many minorities in the land. Let, think about that. And uh, decides to kill the firstborn boys. And the idea was that they would be thrown into the water, that the source of life would in fact become burial grounds. Now, it's, uh, it, it's interesting because there's some connections between the birth of Moses uh, with the creation story. And you can see that these ideas uh, are repetitive in Scripture. Uh, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, it says after B Moses was uh, born that uh, they, they looked on him and he was good. They saw that he was good. It's the same phrase as uh, what was declared about the creation in the Genesis story. And then in an, in an attempt to protect his life, he was placed into an ark. And it's the same word used of Noah's ark. And then eventually uh, Moses' second mother uh, draws him up out of the water and I, I wonder if I, well, at least I think about it as kind of a, a, a second birth uh, kind of a picture. In the Exodus story, uh, we find out that God hears and remembers his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And we talked about how covenant is the central thread that ties all of scripture together in this story and um, Moses uh, eventually of course grows and in, and he experiences God out on a mountain and in the wilderness and again one of these repeated refrains within the scriptural narrative the voice uh, that God that Moses hears comes from the famous burning bush and in that part of the story God reveals God's name to Moses and uh, for the first time the the God of Moses supersedes the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob the the God of Abraham was most uh, prominently known as one of the names was El Shaddai and um, El Shaddai means uh, God with breast. So it's probably more of a feminine uh, connotation there. And now uh, it is Yahweh, the name of God, is revealed uh, to Moses in the burning bush. And what happens now in the scripture is that it is this, this God of Moses that will become the prominent name, the prominent voice. Uh, for the rest of the story and in the narrative it says that God hears the groanings of those that are slaved in Egypt and decides to send Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his people go um, Moses says you have the wrong guy d d d d don't you know that I have a st stuttering problem I can't do what you're asking of me who am I Please send somebody else. And isn't that a very uh, common human experience, isn't it? That we feel inadequate often to do what we feel God has asked us to do. And 
not only does Moses say, I feel adequate or who am I, but, and then adds the question, who, who and by the way, who are you? And uh, it is here, the God says, I am who I am, and I will be with you. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to me, th this is a, a beautiful um, depiction of what I would say is the true gospel or the good news, that God abides with and that God engages for God's people in the world. And it says that God saw the Israelites in their distress and he knew. Not, not, it's not knowing in, in one's head kind of concept, but it's knew, know, knew them, felt the struggle of God's people. He hears the cry of the poor in the story and decides to use Moses to disrupt the reigning order of empire. Now think about that within the given context of our own lives. And it, it, was, it was interesting. I was at a conference where Richard Rohr spoke about something that he heard from an old rabbi regarding the name Yahweh. And um, he said that you Christians don't understand the significance of the word Yahweh. And he, in what the old rabbi did was he made the sound of breathing, inhaling and exhaling. And it sounded like <gasps> Yahweh. Inhale, exhale. And, he, and Richard Rohr said that the first thing uh, when a baby does after being born, that first breath speaks the name of God. And the last thing a human does, human being does when they exhale is they speak the name of God. And that's kind of a beautiful, beautiful idea and beautiful thought to think about. Now, one of the things over the years I've tried to point out at Calvary is that the, um, the Matthew's version of the Christmas story, and there are two Christmas stories, really three, one in Luke, one in Matthew, one in Revelation. And uh, it, it, in Matthew's um, Christmas story, there is a retelling of the Moses story. And uh, again, it's the firstborn that are going to be uh, slaughtered. It is out of Egypt I've called my son. Uh, Israel is my firstborn son. And then the phrase, those seeking uh, your life are dead, are all phrases that are both used in the Exodus Moses story and in the birth of Jesus story. So what the New Testament is trying to say is that Jesus is the new Moses, the new liberator. And I found it interesting when I learned this that, um, you know, when Moses goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let my pe your people go. Um, eventually, uh, there has to be this onslaught of plagues that will change the mind of, of Pharaoh in the story. And the first plague was... Uh, turning the water of the Nile into blood. And the last plague was the, uh, the death of the firstborn um, in Egypt. And I find it interesting that in John's gospel regarding Jesus, there, he uses the concept of the, of the notion of signs. We think of them as miracles, but they're signs that point to something larger. And the first sign in John's gospel in the ministry of Jesus was to turn the water into wine. Um, and that the last sign was uh, to bring life back to Lazarus after he had been, uh, after he had died. So it's almost like the opposite of, of the plagues in Egypt. As you may or not may remember it, uh, that in order for the people to be let go, that last plague, that last terrible plague, the, the death of the firstborn in Egypt, that there would be a distinction made between the Egyptian and the Israelites. And the distinction was made by blood being put over the doorpost of the Israelite families and that the spirit would come through and would pass over the home that was protected by the blood of the lamb. And that's where we get the, uh, that theology. And um, it was interesting because in the New Testament, um, 
the crucifixion story is very much the same, um, uses a lot of the same imagery and poetry as does the Passover. The Passover lamb, the bones were not broken. John's gospel makes sure that we know that Jesus's bones were not broken. The blood was applied by a hyssop plant. Uh, John wants us to know that, uh, that the drink that was given to Jesus on the cross was applied through the hyssop plant. And um, so Jesus in the New Testament becomes the Passover lamb. Um, again, connecting his life and ministry back to the ancient old stories. Now, uh, the people are eventually uh, liberated and uh, they come to the shores of the Red Sea or uh, I think uh, some scholars believe that the actual name is the Reed Sea. Um, and uh, they are um, there. They are camped there, uh, and then Pharaoh's army comes, and you 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 know the scene. And then Moses splits the Red Sea, and the people go through to get to the other side. And what what is being uh, what is happening here is is the truth of the narrative is that the Exodus story and the passing through the waters is really the passing through a birth canal um, and it is through water through the waters that birth comes and um, on the other side of of the lake uh, or the sea um, they will be fed manna in order to be uh, kept alive and i want you to think about how in the ministry of jesus and, uh, and i'm trying to kind of contrast some of these notions here is that he too will be baptized and then driven out into the wilderness for a vision quest uh, much like um, like this story and in his ministry instead of the distinction between Jew and Gentile or Israelite and Egyptian there is an amazing story told in all four Gospels which means it is really significant and that is the the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. And the, the feeding of the 5,000 happens to take place on the Jewish side of the lake. And the, there are numbers in those stories, and I invite you to go back and read those. But the numbers are five, there's five loaves, there's 5,000 men, um, and there are uh, uh, 12 basketfuls of food that are left over. And uh, I want you to think about five as the books of the Pentateuch. Uh, the number 12 refers to the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and the 5,000 uh, is again connected to the notion of five. And on the Gentile side of the lake, there's not 5,000, but this time there are 4,000. And there are seven loaves and baskets that is referred to in the story. And seven is the biblical number for wholeness or completeness. And the four, or the 4,000, represents uh, the four quadrants of the globe, the north, the south, the east, and the west. And so what I think you have in the ministry of Jesus is the, is the bringing together of the Jew and the Gentile, which becomes a central tenet of Pauline theology and it's an amazing story because in, in another narrative where Jesus is crossing the sea and a storm comes up and and the disciples are afraid and uh, Jesus says you guys don't understand the significance of the numbers do you? do you do you remember how many people were fed do you remember how many loaves were left over you still not get what I'm about so those numbers and those stories are not just historic facts. That's the least important part of it. The most important is to understand the significance or the symbolism of those numbers and what they represent. Um, there is another cool piece in the, in the crossing through the Red Sea story and getting on the other side of safety. There is what's called Miriam's Song uh, in Exodus 15. And it's a song of liberation. And if you compare that with uh, Luke chapter 2, you'll find that uh, it's called Mary's Magnificat. And Mary 
is the same name as Miriam, Moses' sister. Um, and so you have the two Marys with two songs of liberation. In Exodus 16, there's a, is the famous story of the manna falling from heaven and how God directs Moses to give directions to the people regarding the collection of manna. And uh, they were in, to, to be able to go out and collect all that they needed for that day. And uh, if they collected more than they needed, they would have enough. And if they didn't collect enough, they'd still have enough. But they were not allowed to collect on the seventh day, for the seventh day was a Sabbath. And if they collected too much and tried to keep it from day to day, it would rot and spoil and, and stink. And lo and behold, of course, that's what we do. We try to collect more than we need, and we try to hoard it, and we try to keep it. And um, it, every Sunday in our service, we pray the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And that is connected back to this notion of how much is enough for us. And that's the question of the Sabbath. How much is enough for on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, they were... Uh, they were not to collect. Um, and in what, what it says in Exodus 16 is that the glory of God would be seen when the bellies were full and people had enough and not too much and there was not greed. And if you read Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament, you will see that this notion of shared community and no lack among the people, that bellies would be full, uh, you'll find the exact same story in my opinion. Now, the, the people, after they've crossed through and begin their journey in the wilderness towards the land of Canaan, they uh, come to the mountain of Sinai. And this is an enormously important part of the Exodus narrative. And you could read about this in Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. And um, got Moses uh, meets God again on the mountain. Uh, we've talked a little bit about how the significance of mountains play an important part in the biblical story. And um, this is where we get what's called the Sinai Covenant. We've talked about the importance of covenant, which is not a contract between uh, me and an object or me and somebody, but uh, covenants are subject oriented. It's between people um, with regards to relationship, not just simply a service. And uh, in the Sinai Covenant or the Mosaic Covenant is this enormously important word, uh, and it only has two, letter, two letters, and those two letters are I and F. And in the Mosaic Covenant, it basically says this, if you are obedient to this covenant, then you will know blessings in your life. If you are not obedient to this covenant, you will know curse in your life or death. It will not go well for you. Um, and here you have what I have called mosaic religion. The idea that it, 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 it plays itself out, for example, in the Job story. Job's friends represent mosaic understanding or thought that uh, things have not gone well now for Job, uh, so he must have been disobedient. But the true story of Job is that he was not disobedient and that we can't look at this um, as a true expression of the divine heart, in my opinion. Uh, but what the Sinai Covenant does, it, do, it creates a people. That Exodus is a birth and now they enter into covenant with God on the mountain. They agree to the stipulations of the covenant they say yes, their vows. We talked about how a wedding is kind of an example of a covenant. They, they take their vows and the people say yes. And what happens is that the Mosaic Covenant becomes a, a charter of national life. And what is born is an ethnic cultural identity, Israel. And I want to read this from my notes to you. Um, because historians will point out that this was an example of what's called a vassal treaty or an alliance of friendship. 
which was very common in the Middle East. There's nothing new in the Mosaic Covenant with regards to how it creates this relationship. And uh, what I find interesting is this, and let me just read it to you. If the relationship was familial or friendly, the parties are referred to as father and son. If the relationship is bereft of kindness and intimacy, the, the, the two parties entering into covenant are referred to as lord and servant, or king and vassal, or greater king and lesser king. The greater king is the suzerain, and the lesser king is a prince, uh, or a lesser lord in the service of the greater king. The lesser lord is a representative of all of the people who, under, who are under the protection of the greater king. In John 15, in the New Testament, Jesus will say to his inner circle and to his disciples, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friend. And you can see the intimacy of the Jesus relationship, the Jesus covenant with his disciples. Now, um, there is a interesting piece in the creation of the ethnic cultural identity in the ratification of the covenant, the ceremony. And in the ceremony, there is once again, the use of blood. Blood obviously plays an enormous role in Hebrew theology and in the Hebrew scriptures. And what happens is that uh, blood, uh, ratifies the covenant it makes it official and the blood was uh, splashed on the altar where the ceremony took place and some of the blood was splashed sh sprinkled out onto the people and you can think of the blood of the covenant what the blood of the covenant does is it creates family and so you can go back and read the abrahamic covenant in 15 uh, chapter 15 in the book of Genesis, there's the use of blood. And in the upper room, Jesus speaks about the wine as the cup of his blood. How the covenant creates family, ratifies um, the, the ceremonial coming together. Um, in Exodus, uh, and that all takes place in Exodus 24, if you want to uh, you wanna read that. Um in the, the, the Mount Sinai experience, you know or remember that uh, there are two tablets given to Moses, and these are the stipulations. Uh, they're called the Ten Words uh, or the Ten Great Commandments. And um, one tablet has to do with the stipulations regarding the relationship with God, and one has to do with the relationship to neighbor. And there you have it, right? The, the Great Commandments, the two to love God and to love neighbor. And the hinge one that connects both of those is the keeping of the Sabbath. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, it says this, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, excuse me, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. In the book of Galatians in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says that the law was something of a school teacher or a school, school, school master that points towards Christ. So another important piece in this, I think it's very important to understand that that keeping the covenant did not create relationship with God. It did not effect relationship with God. That was God given. It reflected relationship with God. It did not effect, it reflects. So um, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of notion of because I've brought you out of the land of Egypt, therefore, you do this, right? Um, love and generosity and kindness and expression of care for others is a reflection of relationship with God. It does not create relationship with God. 
So obedience does not create relationship. Obedience reflects relationship. And a lot of times Christians get that wrong as though, um, you know, Judaism is about keeping the law so that one might be in relationship with God. That is simply not the case. Um, later in the development of Judaism, it was understood and celebrated that the giving of the ten words, the creation of this people, um, took place uh, on Pentecost or the festival of Pentecost commemorated the, the, the creation of Pentecost, commemorated the giving of the ten words to Moses. In the New Testament, of course, Pentecost is, again, the creation story, the birth story of a new people, and that is the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. Um, in Exodus 25, the people are told that in the tabernacle they were to build a tent, and that God would dwell with them in the desert, in the tent. And the word was the tabernacle. In John chapter 1, it says that Jesus came and tabernacled with his people. Uh, Jesus came to be with, to dwell with. Um, a clear connection between the Moses story and the Jesus story. Now... Another beautiful thing, um, I believe, is that when Moses comes down from the mountain after being given the Ten Words, the Ten, the ten Commandments, he encounters the people who had given up faith, who had built the golden calf, who were worshiping an idol, dancing, and, um, you know, I think of the old movies that I've seen. And uh, Moses, in his anger, throws the tablets down. And he calls over to him the priests who were the Levites, the Levitical priests uh, that will be uh, a part of the narrative ongoing in Scripture. He calls the, the sons of Levi over to him and they go through the camp. And you can read about this in Exodus chapter 32. And they kill 3,000 people, it says. Uh, in the New Testament, on the day of Pentecost, uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, after the, birth, after the birth of the church, in Acts 2, 41, it talks about how 3,000 were added to the movement. And so I just, you know, I just don't think that it's fair to read something at the beginning of a story and say, well, this was God's will. I think we have to look at these older stories through the lens of the completed story, looking back and say, how could it be God's will to kill 3,000 and be God's will to add 3,000? So I think that a lot of what's happening in the Jesus ministry is actually a correction of ancient understandings. Um, and that's just my own personal opinion. Um, as you know, the people would spend 40 years in the wilderness, much like Jesus would spend 40 days in the in the wilderness. And I've, I've mentioned earlier in one of the Bible studies that the number 40 is one of those repeated refrains, a piece of poetry in scripture that I was taught represents the notion of the amount of time necessary for God to accomplish something. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, verses 7 through 17, and in Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 11, um, they are at the border, eventually, of entering into uh, the promised land. And it says, the Lord is bringing you into a good land. This is the border reflection. Finally, after all these years, they're at the border. The Lord is bringing you into a good land. There will be no one in need among you if you open your hand. The, the possession of the promised land was contingent. It was, it was conditional if they were generous with one another. This uh, ends the story of the captivity and the Exodus narrative. Um, and it just kind of uh, points to the fact that 
that there is an immense seduction to um, self-sufficiency and self-indulgence and self-congratulation, the story of Babel again. And that um, people will, from this point on, see Moses as the preeminent prophet and that in the future, uh, the Messiah uh, will be a prophet like Moses. And in John chapter 6, verse 14, Jesus is referred to as the prophet like Moses. I hope that uh, gives you a little taste of there's so much important pieces in this part of the, of the story that will continue to build on the coming of the Christ. God bless you as you look through some of these scriptures. Amen.